It's time, folks. It's time for a rebuild. And if it wasn't clear before, it was definitely clear after last night's 5 nothing loss to the Boston Bruins, a game which featured a fan providing a giant piece of symbolism surrounding the Nashville Predators franchise. Coming up today on the Locked on Predators podcast. Your Locked on Predators, your daily podcast on the Nashville Predators. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Predators your first listen of the day. Every single day, we are your free daily Nashville Predators podcast that's available to you wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube. I'm Nick Morgan. I'm a writer and editor at OnTheForeCheck.com, and I have a partner in crime. You do. I am Ann Kimmel. I'm a writer and editor at InsideThePreds.com. And on this wonderful Friday morning, we also have a financial partner in crime. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On Predators. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Well, here we are, Anne. What a day to come to work, Nick. Uh, What a day. Yeah, I mean, uh, like, I I don't know where to begin on this. I mean, it's just, it's not even the Preds 5-0 loss to the Boston Bruins. We kind of even said, yeah, there's a chance it could go that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's just everything with this team right now. It's the discourse around the franchise some of it we're gonna get to the fan reaction uh it's just the way the preds are losing games it's just players that you expect better of routinely (coughs) making bad mistake after bad mistake and there's just so much in (coughs) yeah there's just so much this This is not a fun time to be a Nashville Predator fan. It feels like that old poem about the baseball player that struck out in Mudville. Like, that's where we're at right now. It is not a fun time to be a Nashville Predator fan. And there are layers to the frustration and layers to the disappointment. And the game last night, like you said, we knew, we knew going in best team in the league, you know, you're playing the Boston Bruins who have only lost eight, gone to overtime and lost five times. You knew what this could potentially be like, but it is sort of a cataclysmic event for all sorts of layers of, of Nashville feelings. Yeah, those layers include a a catfish incident last night that, boy, is it just not the perfect metaphor uh, for where this team is right now. It included what you described as maybe the most defeated you've heard Roman Yossi uh, in a postgame conference. It included a player who had a very, very bad game. uh, And instead of solace, John Hines... uh, seemed very very angry about it uh in the post game kind of a deviant from his usual tone there's just so much to get to but first uh yeah let's talk about the game itself uh bruins went up one nothing in the first period off of a three on one caused by jeremy lazan pinching in way too much that was followed up by three more goals uh, in the second period, two of them, which actually went off Jeremy Lazan. I think you're kind of starting to see the one player who had a bad game tease coming to fruition here. Uh, and then the Predators, again, let in a uh, pretty well set up goal by Trent Frederick. 5 uh, nothing. It absolutely was a scene from Bridgestone Arena in which the fans turned on the team and your one word to describe last night's five, nothing loss to the Boston Bruins. My one word was going to be, I have no words. And I was simply not going to participate in this exercise after last night's game, because it y'all, it was 
the worst. I truly mean when I tell you it was the worst hockey viewing experience that I've had. This was a harder game to watch for me than the Colorado sweep last season. This was a harder game to watch for me than when the Predators lost in game six of the Stanley Cup finals. This was the hardest hockey game, the hardest 60 minutes of hockey I have ever sat through. Um, and so I decided I would come up with a one word. I am going to jump back in and participate in our little evaluation that we do. And my one word is requiem. A requiem is a mass for the repose of the souls of the dead. And friends, you know, I we are hoctimists. We have talked about this. I There are players on this team who I think are tremendously talented and are, you know, and one bad game. I don't want to speak anything over them. I am a defender of John Hines for a lot of, in a lot of ways. I am a defender of David Poyle in some ways, but you know what? After last night, I sing a requiem for the Nashville Predators because this franchise feels like this chapter is dead. It's, mm -hmm. It is it is over. The chapter that the Predators have been in, the chapter that this franchise has hung on to, is over. And it's a sad, I mean, it's a sad, sad thing. I think I think it's over. So my one word is requie requiem. I sing a requiem tonight for the Predators. Yeah. It's funny you said that. Uh, I was going to go much darker with my <laughs> one word, but this felt like the divorce papers. Oh, yes. The divorce papers is kind of where I see this team right now. Look, it's 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 the story of a marriage, a story of a love that started way back Honestly, 2015, when the Predators started to ramp up their play a little bit more, the the honeymoon was the or the let's just say the wedding was 2017. Yes. Honeymoon was 2018. Mm -hmm. And then the challenges started to creep in. Right. A little bit. And this team went to therapy. You know, they mm -hmm. made some life changes by bringing in some new players, some fresh blood, refreshing some members of the core bring in some new members of the core. They tried it. They even adopted some wonderful little children in the form of, you know, Phil Tomasino, Yuso Parsonen, some up and coming young players just to try to see if the magic came back. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, they left some of those young children on the school bus. On the, they wound up in Milwaukee instead of at school, but I digress. And it's just kind of come to that point where, you know, the couple has to sit down and realize maybe that spark is just gone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe we've tried everything that we can try and it's just not getting better. It's It kind of got better, but it's just not where it needs to be. And I think this is the moment that David Poyle and his partner, which is the entity of the Nashville Predators, the players on the team, he needs to sit down and realize it's time to divorce the Nashville Predators as we know it. It's time to break up. It's time for everyone to start a new chapter. And that includes probably what is going to be at least a moderate rebuild. And when I say moderate, I mean there are going to be a lot of familiar faces, people whose jerseys we have, people who we've been cheering for for more than a decade at this point. There are going to be some people, longtime beloved Nashville Predators, who will not have a spot on this team next year. Yeah. And that's, on, and that's a hard truth, but it it's what needs to happen. It's a bad hockey Barry Manilow song unfolding right now. I pictured Landslide uh, by Fleetwood Mac. There you go. Yeah, that's and, where that's where we're at. And it's kind of a fitting song, too, because Landslide is is beautiful story uh, written by Stevie Nicks, where she was in Aspen and kind of looking at the snow up on the mountaintop and kind of realizing 
you know, that snow can just kind of avalanche down at any moment. And, you know, she started reflecting on life and all these things that she'd built up on what was kind of this perfect life and realized, you know, it's so fragile that it could just come crashing down at any moment. And that's why, you know, there's that song is kind of attributed to breakups. Mm-hmm. Also kind of at a wedding song. I don't know what's <laughs> going on there. <laughs> Figure out your brand, Stevie. But, you know, it's this beautiful song about, you know, wanting to keep things together but having to let go and having to let some of these changes play out. And boy, is that just a good song for what the Nashville Predators are at right now. Just all this wonderful core, this team of players, maybe the best core of players the Nashville Predators have ever assembled. The team that led us to one of our favorite moments as a fan. Yes. The the Stanley Cup run. Yes. The President's Trophy the next season, all these incredible moments. And we tried. We tried to build off that. We tried to keep them together. We tried to help them grow. And it's just, it's, we held on to that hope that made, and you and I both, as Hoptimists, held on to that hope that maybe it would change. Like, maybe last year was the rallying cry. And it's just, nothing's getting better And I think we have to accept, bite the bullet, that there are uh, some changes ahead of us. Yeah, I I think this is a turning point. I will also tell you that there could very easily be unfurled an argument for why that is not true after last night. And that's a little frustrating. All right. Uh, Well, I feel like I should follow up on that question. So (laughs) let's do that. Uh, in just a little bit. First, though, I want to mention today's show is brought to you by maybe the highlight of the morning so far, and that's Built Bar. Ann and I have talked about Built Bar. They are one of our favorite uh, treats. That's because it's not just a delicious snack. It is also a healthy snack full of protein. If you're looking for a delicious treat without the fat and calories, Built Bar is for you. So what do you uh, think makes these so good? For starters, all covered in 100% real chocolate. They come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter, brownie, coconut, almond. And I'm not sure how Built does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar. But as we mentioned, they have incredible macros. Only 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, and a whopping 17 grams of protein to keep you full throughout the day. And now you don't need to wait around for a box. For years, we've been telling you that you can go order Built Bars at Built.com. Well, now you can get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. Go to Walmart today, head to the pharmacy section, and grab a box of Built Bars, a four-pack of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut puffs. Or go to Sam's Club and get a 13-bar box with hit flavors like brownie batter and churro. Thank us later. You are going to want to try Built. So head to your local store or visit built.com to see all the flavors available to you. All right, Ann, I just poured my heart out, invoked Mm -hmm. Stevie Nicks. You did. As to why this team is probably due for a rebuild and why it's coming sooner rather than later. And you just threw that away with, there's some evidence that it's not going to happen. So I need to hear what evidence you have, ma'am. I want to be clear that I am not saying that I disagree with you. What I am saying is, let me tell you what is the going to be some talking points when this position is pushed. Here are some talking points that you may very well hear, especially after last night's game. Okay. Because I was chatting with another reporter and and we were talking about the state of the team. And this particular person said, surely surely now there will be changes. And I said, let me tell you how this conversation could go. Okay. We just lost to the Boston Bruins. Now look, the Boston Bruins are 48 and five. Yeah. So do 13 other teams need to make big changes? Because let's face it, when you look at the Boston Bruins, this is hands down on paper and quite frankly on ice, the best team in the league. 
Yeah. So, so many teams, I mean, they, they've won 40 games. Should, you know, all of the teams that lost to the Bruins, do they need to upset their apple cart? No. You know, was it a tough loss? Yes. Was it expected? Well, we're disappointed in it. Push in a little further on it. So say somebody pushes in a little further. Yeah, but the Predators were shut out in this game, pushing in on that. Like, hey, here's what you may hear back in reply. I know, but man, we didn't have Philip Forsberg. Philip Forsberg is our leading scorer. He is such a generator of offense. He's a generational talent. He is who this core offensively is built around. And, you know, this team didn't have Philip Forsberg. This could have been a different game if we would have had Philip Forsberg. Mm -hmm. Then what you're going to hear is, oh, gosh, I know there was just a couple of bad breaks. A couple of bad breaks. You mentioned Jeremy Lazan. You know what? Bad puck bounces. Those those goals that went in off Lazan, one went off his skates, one went off of his stick. There, You know what? That is part of hockey. That's just something that happens in hockey. And you don't want to make drastic changes over bad puck bounces. Yeah. So there is, there is space for... And, and we're optimists. If there were people hanging on by their fingernails, it would be Nick and I. Yeah. It would be us. <laughs> yeah. But what I fear is that this isn't the game that's going to be a tipping point. No matter how it felt in that arena. And let me tell you, Nick, the vibe in that arena was like nothing I've ever experienced before. It was, I would say, generously 50-50 Bruins, Predators it fans. It in more than 50-50, and it sounded it's, like a game at TD Garden. It did. It did. I actually had someone text me and say, "This is is this a home game? Are you working this game? Because or are we in Boston? And I'm like, oh, friends, <laughs> we're yeah. at home. It was a very... There was a high percentage of Boston Bruins fans, which I do want to say this because I saw a comment on Twitter and I have to address this because this is ridiculous. Uh, somebody said, this is why you have to fire Hines. Listen to that arena. Look at that no. arena. That's why you have. No, this was the tweet. I swear to you. This is the tweet. This is why you have to fire Hines. Listen but to that, that arena. It's like that in Tampa. Dude. Like it's like that in Arizona. I mean, Boston fans are Boston fans. They travel everywhere. I over like in, in December went to Vegas. Vegas is a very good team with a notoriously pretty good young fan base. And that arena was packed with Boston fans. It's that's right. that's the thing. Can I back up to, to the Please. argument you made about Please. that? Um, yeah, everything you said makes sense. Like this is the best team in the league. You're going to have off nights. You don't have Philip Forsberg to kind of push that offense. That's all great. I, I agree with that. Here's my follow-up. What's the excuse for Arizona? Thank you. What's yes. the excuse last week for Vegas when he lost 5-1 with Philip Forsberg in the lineup? Mm -hmm. Like, what's, yeah. what's the excuse when, you know, this excuse doesn't work? And look, it's like, you know – it's probably you would equate it to like parenting a kid who just gets in trouble all the time. And it's like, you know what, for three years, you know, you've been suspended, you've been suspended from school. You got caught cheating. You came home for a few months. You got back on the right horse. Three months is up. You're out busted for drinking at a party. And then you get busted the next night drinking at another party. You come home, you're good for three months. And then three months is that you rob a liquor store. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if any of your kids have ever robbed a liquor I store. I swear they <laughs> haven't <laughs> yet so, that so I know so of. <laughs> um, it, it's like, you know what? There's so many times where it's like, no, no, no. I've changed. I've changed. Maybe a better example is like the, the douchebag boyfriend. Or girlfriend. Yes. It's like, no, yes. no, I'm sorry for cheating. Take me back. Take me back. And it's just mm -hmm. how many times do you have to hear, no, no, we're on the right track. We're rebuilding. Look, we had this closed door meeting and look, we had some good hockey after that. Like we, we got this, like, we just need to get on the right track. Oh, look, we've won three in a row and Carolina was one of them. How many times do you have to go through that? Mm -hmm. before you're like, I, I don't have trust. I don't have trust in this team. I don't have trust. They're going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. 
it, that's who that's more that, that's where I'm at right now. Who are your trust issues with in this scenario? Because I'm with you. Look, when I look at this roster, this is a roster with talent. This is a roster. Uh, is is it is it Boston level talent? No, I I will Whoa. I will say. Uh, but that, but I will say one. Right. That's, I mean, that's, a, I'm not, I don't disagree that that's a huge pro problem, but who are your trust issues with, with the Nashville Predators? Is it David Poyle? Is it John Hines? Is it the players? Or is it a mix of them? Who are your trust issues with right now? I mean, I mean, pretty much everybody. It's <laughs> funny. Because, I date none of them. Well, but John Hines is the one that everyone's like, oh yeah, he's, they got to fire Hines, right? He's probably the one I would blame the least. Like, Thank you. Third on that list. Like, say what you will about some of the players he has in the lineup, but for the players, this has gone on since Peter Laviolette. Like, this was an issue back then. I don't think you can blame, like, like you know, hey, if Cole Smith costs you a game or something and you want to put Heinz's decision under the microscope, sure. But are you going to blame him for Mikhail Granlin having an absolutely dismal season or Ryan Johansson behind his scoring pace or Matt Duchesne and Philip Forsberg, not where they were last year, or Nino Niederreiter not necessarily panning out the way you want? Do you blame that on John Hines? John I'm Hines asking. is going to play those players regardless. Uh, I would like to see him make a few changes, but look, to me, this is, this is something that David Poyle has got to bite the bullet and do. And it sounds like, to his credit, uh, it seems like that may be happening. I mean, we've heard from Pierre Lebrun yesterday. Uh, we heard it in Elliot Friedman's 32 Thoughts, uh, you know, sometime over the past couple of weeks. It just seems like David Poyle is kind of now, okay, like, I'm listening to offers. Like, yeah. tell, me, tell me what you got. It, it seems like, I would imagine there's probably some restrictions on players, but um, it, it seems like... Yeah, everybody's uh, everybody's available. Yeah, and I agree with you. When it comes to my trust issues with this team, the person I trust the most is actually John Hines, because people are saying he is not getting these play. He's not getting the most out of these players. Well, he was the coach last season when you had three players with career years, and you had a Vesna Trophy nominee, yeah. and you had a Norris Trophy nominee. So I'm not sure. But then I say to you, Nick. How comfortable do you feel with David Poyle making the deals at the deadline and handling offseason moves and setting this team up for a rebuild? Where are your trust issues with that? We'll see. Yeah. Like, we'll see what happens at the deadline. I mean, like if, if if he is willing to make some big moves, like if he's willing to like actually trade some significant pieces and maybe be sellers. If the Predators fall out of it, which it appears that they are, uh, I think Alex Doherty on AZ Sports put out and it's the Preds would basically have to win like tw at least tw half of their next 42 games, um, which doesn't seem looking at the schedule and looking at the way the Preds have played uh, possible. Um, you know, if, if he can go out and make some moves and prove that, oh, you know, what I don't want to hear is what the we heard in, in 2021 uh, or even to a lesser extent in 2020 where he had some opportunities to sell some players. And it's like, well, I didn't really want to sell them. You know, I still believe in this team. I still believe they can win. If you're honest about what's going on with this team and you can back that up by making some necessary moves to – put us in the right direction moving forward, then you know what? Sure. But let's see how it goes. I know there's a lot of people that don't have trust that David Poyle is going to be the right guy, mm -hmm. but I mean, we'll, we'll have to see like that's, that's out of our hands at this point. Um, you know, we'll see what moves he makes and if we can talk about trust. So let's talk about just a little shift here. Let's talk about the catfish incident and, and, and dive into a little a little bit of that. So for anybody who maybe wasn't watching, and I don't know how much of this was on the broadcast or no, no. it was it was, was on, it on all the broadcast. On the broadcast okay, good, good. Because I was like, y'all are not gonna believe this. Yeah. But it was uh I don't even know what point in the third period. It was it was like it was much. like 10 seconds left. But yeah, it, it, was, there it was, was play. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, not much time left. And I'm not sure I would love to, to talk to whoever chucked this catfish because I have questions. So with about 10 seconds left, the Predators are down 5 nothing. The, the Bridgestone Arena is rocking with chance of let's go Bruins because by the fourth goal, the floodgates opened and Bridgestone emptied out of Predator stands. So we are now in a predominantly Boston environment and a Predators fan, I'm assuming, unless it was some sort of like mock... <laughs> chucked a catfish on the ice with like 10 seconds left in the game. What, what is that about? I have, I have a couple thoughts, but what is that about for you? Like, what, is, what did you period. think? 10 seconds of the second period left. So oh, was it second was, period? It was second period. So it Are was you like sure? 100%. And it's also like, if you watch it, like it's the play was in that end. Like this oh. wasn't just like you know the buzzer had rang and like they're doing around and somebody just threw it up. Like the the catfish almost got in the middle of the play. Oh yeah, and yeah. Someone had you, to skate around it. Yeah, and if you could see the fan that did it, you could see it on the broadcast a little bit. If you go back and look at some of the clips, this wasn't like a get your team fired up like catfish toss at the beginning of the end, like scene. This was a screw this type of yeet. Like this, is, <laughs> this was Walter White throwing the pizza on the roof in Breaking Bad. This was Darth Vader throwing Emperor Palpatine down the little electric hole to nowhere. Come like, on. This was an anger toss. This was like frustration. This is like the pitcher that gets pulled in baseball and winds up just throwing the Gatorade tube down down the tunnel to the clubhouse this was an anger toss yeah and you know, it's interesting Anne, because the catfish is the symbol of the nashville predators fan base it's mm -hmm. it's been and it, you think about what it symbolizes it was created as basically an f you to the detroit red wings because mm -hmm. they had the octopus and this was like we're doing this our own way this is our identity we're like the stone cold Steve Austin of the NF or the NHL. Like you may come in here, you may have the better team, but we're going to make this a tough pay place to play. We're going to give you everything we got. You're going to have to like kick us in the face 29 times and we're going to get up 28 uh, to, to beat us and all that good stuff. And to see a fan angrily throw that on the ice. I mean, isn't that just symbolism for fans kind of taking you know, the biggest symbol of the team and just throwing it on the ice nonchalantly in the middle of a game. And, you know, I, I don't know if it was out of anger or if it was, you know, he really was just trying to get the crowd fired up and pissed about the Go Bruins chance. But I, I it, it's it was a noticeable symbolism for, I think, how the fan base feels about the franchise right now. Yeah. And here's what I will say about the catfish toss. Number one, I didn't understand it. So I would love, I would love a conversation with the, the tosser because I'm curious, like, let's, let's talk through the, the thought process and, and what, what it means to you. Number two, if you're going to throw a catfish on the ice during play against the Boston Bruins, why the hell did you not hit Brad Marchand? Yes. I was hoping for like a duck hunt style thing where you just nail him in the face. Like, let that catfish tail just slap him across the face. Like, let that corpse just come at him from nowhere and do it for the sake of so many NHL fans everywhere. So that was kind of my other thing. Like, if you're going to do that, like, aim. Just yeah. aim. But I wonder, you know, we've talked before about the fan base and the frustration of the fan base. Do you think... It has reached its boiling point. And do you think it is going to matter? Because I'll be honest with you, I don't think up to this point, I don't think that the fan base's reaction matters that much. I don't think that it weighs in to a lot of the thought process. And I wonder if the environment of the game last night, if the... Boston Bruins kind of overtaking Bridgestone Arena if the tossing of the the yeeting of the catfish in frustration 
will any of that register up high enough with a community of people who tend to keep outside noise outside mm. to make any difference in decisions come, you know, going forward in this next couple of days, next couple of weeks to the trade deadline? Is it going to matter how this this fan base feels? Well, what's one thing all ownership cares about, including the Nashville Predators ownership? It's money. Ching. Yeah. If those fans don't show up, if attendance just drops, if season ticket holders don't renew, which, I mean, it sounds like for one reason or another, it, it has been. I don't have official numbers, but, you know, any Nashville Predators game, you if you go to any Nashville Predators game the past two years, it's different than what it was yeah. back in 2015, 2016, 2017. I mean, it's half empty, like it's quiet. There aren't just those constant chants ringing out anymore. Even like the goal chants are like, you know, the you suck chants are kind of half-hearted now. It's just a much different vibe. And I think you're going to reach the point, especially if the Preds bottom out, mm -hmm. which I think there's a real, you know, I, I don't know if they're ever going to do like the full, we're going to tank and, and do that kind of rebuild. I'm sure they would like to try to remain as quasi competitive as possible, but you know, the more you have those types of environments where, you know, the fans aren't into it. And then all of a sudden the casual fans are going to be like, well, this isn't as fun anymore. Right. And then they're, and then they're going to tune out. And then if the Preds are bad, then the people around town are going to be like, eh, you know, not really going to follow the Preds right now. Let's see how the Titans are doing. And all of a sudden they're, you know, B block, C block on your, you know, sports talk or your evening sports cast. And it's just the interest is going to go down. And I think if that happens and you kind of get to a point where you were pre- you know, I would say, you know, pre first lockout, uh, you know, maybe at points, you know, in, in the late 2000s, where it's just nobody's really following the Predators, no one's talking with them, and they're not doing well enough to really register uh, among casual fans. Then I think you got a problem. Um, it's just a matter of if are the Preds going to hit that point? Or are they going to be proactive and do something that's like, we have to stop it from getting to that point? Right. And I would go on record as saying, you know, I, I am an emotional hockey fan. I am an emotional hockey viewer. So I tend to be invested in players. And so, you know what, not going to lie. I have a little bit of angst, maybe just a little bit of a tingle of shingles when I think about, you know, Matthias Ekholm ending up somewhere else, but that's for another podcast. Mm -hmm. But I would say that I think most fans that we hear from would be more interested in investing money, watching a rebuild, watching some of these young players developing. Then I think that they are at this point watching what feels like the end of this yeah. huge long chapter. I think the fans are far more interested and would be more interested in maybe losing more games for a while, but watching a rebuild than they are hanging on to this. Yeah. Uh, real quick, because we mentioned it, uh, mm -hmm. I mentioned Jeremy Lazan did not have the best game, was way out of position yeah. uh, that led to the first yeah. three on one. Uh, the second one, Puck bounced off him into the net. Uh, fourth goal, Puck bounced off him into a net. Uh, it looked like hockey bounces to us. Mm -hmm. Just kind of look like, you know, it was just kind of bad luck for him. First one, bad play. Last two. Yeah, that kind of sucks. Uh, so, you know, we're expecting, you know, John Hines, when he was asked about it, to say something like, yeah, you know, that that happens. You know, you got to you got to buck up and put it behind you. That's not what he said about Jeremy Lazan after the game, man. No, actually, it was surprising. We talked with Roman Yossi and he kind of said, look, we've all been there. These things happen, you know, kind of that. We asked, uh, the media asked John Hines, you know, hey, like, what do you what do you say to a player who, you know, gosh, just has that awful puck luck? And John Hines's reply, and, uh, and I should have 
clipped uh, made a clip of it for you to hear it verbatim. But just the gist of that was the takeaway for Jeremy Lazan in that situation is you don't overextend your shift. You make the shift change when you're supposed to make the shift change. And then you're not stuck down there playing defense dead tired. That's what I would say. So Jeremy is on healthy scratch coming up uh, at, at some point soon. All I'm saying is if I'm Jordan Gross in Milwaukee, I'm keeping my cell phone charged. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Um, one person I do want to shout out real quick, Ann, uh, mm-hmm. and only because we were kind of whatever on him uh, in his first game back. I really like the way Phil Tomasino played last night. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we talked about we talked about his moment with the empty net. Uh, at the end of that Arizona goal, how he kind of looked a little bit timid with the puck. Right. Looked like he was still starting to get in. I thought he had some jump last night. I thought he did a real good job of attacking the net. Yes. Getting to the front of the net, driving the play, getting right up in the goalie's face with the puck, staying there for any follow-up chances. So uh, that's just a quick thing that I want to give a shout-out to. Shout-out to Phil Tomasino for how he played last night. Yep. Here for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that was, that was a therapy session more than it was a podcast. I think it was, it uh, was. But, but we're glad you guys were along for the ride. Uh, predators have back to back games this weekend, dear God. Uh, and we will be back Monday with some plus minus to walk through each of those two games. And where can the people find your work? You can find my work online at insidethepreds.com. You can find me on Twitter at Ann K underscore Mama on Ice. You can find me at onthefourcheck.com. Follow me on Twitter at underscore NS Morgan or follow the podcast at LO underscore Predators. Uh, however you're listening to us, whether you're watching us on YouTube or listening on your favorite podcasting platform, hit that subscribe button. Not only will you be the first to know when we have new content out for you, but it also helps us out a little bit as well. That's going to do it for us on today's Locked on Predators podcast. Thank you so much for making us your first listen of the day. We'll see you Monday with some all new episodes. See you then.